Hello and welcome everyone to today's webinar where we'll get a peek into the way Google and Adobe think about video accessibility. My name is Josh Miller. I'm one of the founders of 3Play Media where we offer solutions for accessibility, user engagement, and video search through a more advanced transcription and captioning process. We're really excited to have two experts on video accessibility with us today, Andrew Kirkpatrick from Adobe and Naomi Black from Google. The collective technologies of Adobe and YouTube power the vast majority of web video today. Andrew is a group product manager for accessibility at Adobe Systems. Andrew's team defines Adobe's overall product strategy for accessibility, and they work across Adobe's entire product line. He and his team also work with customers in several standards groups, including the U.S. Access Board's Section 508 Advisory Committee and the W3C Accessibility Working Groups. Naomi is an Engineering Program Manager for Accessibility Engineering at Google. Naomi works with engineering teams to help make the web and mobile devices more accessible for all, and she also works on captions for YouTube. It's worth noting that both Naomi and Andrew serve, serve as members of the Video Programming Accessibility Advisory Committee, known as VPAC. This is the committee that oversees all recommendations for implementing an as good or better captioning experience for television programming delivered over the web and all other streaming-based devices. VPAC was created by the FCC after the 21st Century Communications and Video Accessibility Act of 2010 was sworn into law by President Barack Obama. This is also referred to as the CVAA and was a major milestone in establishing accessibility policies aimed at web-based content. Some quick administrative items. Uh, the hashtag for people following along on Twitter will be video accessibility as you see on the screen. It's spelled out as video A11Y, all one word. Please also feel free to type any questions during the webinar into your window and we will address them at the end of the presentation. Uh, we'll also be posting a recorded version of this webinar on our website with captions and an interactive transcript. So in case you want to revisit any of the topics discussed, it will be there for you. So with that, we're going to get started. We have one hour for this webinar. Naomi and Andrew will give us a joint presentation where they'll discuss why captioning is a good idea, go over the CVAA, as well as some Adobe and Google-specific technology updates. We'll then follow that with audience questions for however much time there is remaining. So we'll now pass control over to Andrew, who's going to start us off. The first topic that we wanted to just spend a, a couple minutes on is just in response to the question, why do we need to deliver our captions? And unfortunately, too often the, the answer is in reverse order to uh, the order of bullets on the slide. Um, but really, the first reason needs to be the users that, that benefit from, from the presence of the captions. There are uh, approximately 48 million deaf and hard of hearing users um, in the U.S. Um, and this you know, relates probably to about 15% of your, of your visitors, um, assuming equal distribution across, um, across the population. Um, captions, in addition to providing essential access for deaf and hard of hearing users, um, also enable companies to do searching so that there's indexing of videos that is uh, very accurate for um, uh, when caption data is used because it's uh, precise with what's being spoken. Um, also benefits people who speak English as a second language. Um, and occasionally people may find that uh, when they've missed the daily show at, uh, at night and they want to watch it uh, during the day, uh, the captions that are present there that are offered um, um, via MTV on the Daily Show uh, can be enabled and you can uh, quietly without disturbing your colleagues uh, catch up on what you missed last night. The final reason on this slide is the legislation. Uh, there's the CVAA, um, which was just, uh, just mentioned. There's also Section 508, which applies to uh, U.S. federal government and uh, many education uh, institutions and states uh, where closed captioning is required. And there's other legislation as well that is applied. Um, there's a recent um, uh, lawsuit that was filed 
uh, against a video provider in California, which was based on uh, the Americans with Disability Act uh, in California. So there's there's good reasons uh, to pay attention to captioning, um, which should for everyone start with you know enabling access for the end users. For the CBAA, which is one of the reasons that um, captioning and video accessibility is a big topic now, um, the CBAA um, enabled the FCC to issue a new regulation for closed captioning. This was issued in early January for a, a new report and order. Um, it has not yet uh, been officially published in the Federal Register, so all the dates that are mentioned on, on this slide um, flow from the date that it finally does get um, put into the Federal Federal Register, which we expect to be shortly, but um, don't know exactly when that will be. But basically, um, any video content that was broadcast um, over the uh, television, when it is shown online um, without any editing, there's going to be a six-month deadline um, whereupon after that, that date, um, the captions will need to need to be present. So if it was captioned on TV, it's going to need to be captioned um, online or via internet delivery uh, mechanisms um, for any of that video content. If the content is edited, the deadline is going to be after 12 months after the Federal Register posting for live content, um, 18 months, and then archived content, which is content that's already online and doesn't have captions, there's going to be two years uh, from that date. So we expect that these dates are going to impact the fall programming um, for major broadcasters. Um, but uh, as I said, it, it all depends on when that uh, rule actually gets published in the Federal Register. One of the things that um, is not very well understood in terms of um, what is in the um, report and order is um, about controls for users. And there's an interesting comparison to, to make here between um, platform versus application management of this type of control. Um, looking at a couple of specific examples, if we talk about uh, viewing captions on an iPad, for example, the iPad contains uh, a setting to go into the um, uh, general settings and you look at video, um, there's a simple control for turning closed captioning, for enabling closed captioning. And that's at the platform level. So if you're showing video uh, via WebKit, um, it's going to honor that platform setting. Um, contrasting that with if you have a, a website and it's showing uh, closed captions, it may have closed caption controls right on the video player. Um, and that's something that a individual developer or a developer team needs to enable. Um, and there will still be this, this distinction after the FCC's uh, rule is enacted, but it's something that's an important consideration for developers to keep in mind in terms of understanding you know, what their responsibilities are, whether they just have to deliver video with a caption file and the platform takes care of it, or whether they have to do more work or integrate some additional code in order to enable that sort of access. Um, some of the new types of controls that users are going to need to be able to be provided um, that we haven't seen traditionally online include the following items that are that are on the uh, on the slide here. Um, what we typically have seen with closed captioning online for many years, because captions have been, it's been possible to, to deliver captions for many years now, um, is we typically see white captions in the bottom center of the screen. They're usually in a specific font, a uh, simple, often, you know, often it's Arial, uh, and that's, that's where the captions are. The types of new controls that are going to be required is to be able to control the character color, the color density or opacity, uh, the font, the font size, various edge attributes, the background color for the caption region, um, as well as being able to control the language um, for the caption. So if they're offered in multiple languages, there's going to need to be a control to allow, allow users to switch between them. So this is um, the level of control that is far more similar to what we see in 
uh, television sets today. So if you have an HD television set and you go to the caption controls, you will find analogs to, to these features um, on your television set. So you, you can choose the color and the font. Um, on TVs, you only get choices of eight fonts. Um, online, you know, there's a greater possibility of providing a larger number of different fonts um, than that. So it's, it's, a, it's a very different level of control than we've dealt with for captions online, where in the past it's pretty much been captions on or off. Um, but it's, it's, uh, that is definitely changing. Want to talk about a few specific uh, Adobe products that where we're doing work around captioning. Um, there's far more going on, um, both in development that I can't speak about, um, and there's also you know more in-depth information about all of these that's available on our website. But uh, just as an overview, um, Premiere is one of our products where we do a lot of work with closed captioning. Uh, Premiere is our video editing tool, professional video editing tool. Um, and it has some new features, um, such as being able to import uh, 608 and 708 to caption data uh, directly. And then not only import it against, but also it's, it's showed in the, editing, in the editor while, um, while the video is being worked on. There's also some additional tools supporting speech analysis and script alignment, which can help uh, teams who are doing work with, with video um, also support closed captioning with, uh, with the work that they're doing. For Flash Professional, um, we've had support with uh, Flash for several years now, about five years. Um, our support generally centers around uh, TTML, which is the W3C time text markup language uh, caption format. This was previously known as DFXP. Um, and what the Flash Professional tool does is it provides uh, components. There's an FLV playback component and an FLV, FLV playback captioning component. And that captioning component, uh, when there's a parameter that's set to uh, reference uh, an XML file that's in the proper TTML format, um, that caption data is parsed and inserted as what are called action script cue points. And then when the time on that cue point is, uh, is reached during the video, then the captions appear. There's lots of different um, capabilities in terms of formatting uh, and flexibility for the author to determine how those captions are displayed uh, that is provided within that. The FLP playback captioning component doesn't provide the same level of functionality that the FCC is going to be requiring, so that requires some additional custom work on the part of uh, developers in order to implement that when using that component. Captivate is a simple tool that we have for e-learning. And this actually takes a different approach in that this tool has a built-in captioning tool that allows authors to create captions for, um, for e-learning presentations and demonstrations. Going back to the developer side, um, OSMF is the open source media framework that Adobe participates and contributes to. Um, and it has a couple of different uh, components within it. One is for supporting TTML, uh, but there's also a, a different plugin that's available for supporting SMPTE time time text. Um, this, is, this is one that, um, because there's active work going on with the SMPTE committee, this is um, under continuous development now uh, to improve the level of support that we provide there. Um, but uh, authors who want to deliver a uh, video with captions can take a choice, take their choice between these different plugins for TTML or SMPTE time text to be able to provide support for closed captioning within uh, players that they create with the open source media framework. Um, so worth also mentioning, it's not about captioning, but OSMF also supports audio description via a feature that's called late binding audio. Um, and this, in addition to supporting audio description, also allows for there to be alternative uh, tracks for uh, support of different language audio for a particular video. And we're going to do a demonstration of uh, the open source media frameworks, um, some, some new work in there, but we're going to do that after um, Naomi does her demo of uh, YouTube's player's work. So, and 
that's the end of my quick set of slides, and I'm going to throw it over to Naomi to uh, talk about uh, Google's work. Hello, this is Naomi Black. Um, I work at Google on accessibility engineering. Um, I'm an engineering program manager, and I'm just waiting to see uh, the setting to share my screen here. So um, I wanted to start by talking a little bit about some of Google and YouTube's goals for closed captioning. And our, our big goal is we would, we would really like every video to have closed captions. And when you think about legislation and which areas of video that legislation applies to, um, that may motivate some people to add captions to their videos, but we really think that self-interest is going to be the best motivator. And so in order to achieve our goal of getting closed captions on every video that's online, um, we want to do a few things to help encourage people to see that this is valuable. So the first is we want to make captioning really easy to do. We want it to be something that you don't have to be a professional or an expert to do, um, but if you are working with a professional or an expert, it should be really easy for you to take those files that you have and add them to Google videos and add them to YouTube. So um, we also want to show people who are captioning their videos that there are benefits to doing this. And so one of the ways that we do this is we use the closed captions to make the videos easier to find in search. We integrate uh, translation features, and I'll show this to you in my demo. And by translating and providing captions that can be translated, you enable your video to reach not just a small media audience that speaks the same language, but you can actually reach the entire world. And so what we're seeing is we're seeing more and more partners online who are adding captions to their videos, even though there's no requirement for them to do it necessarily in many areas, but because they recognize that by doing this, they're going to reach a greater audience, and because um, the bar for adding captions has become much, much lower than it used to be. <clears throat> so. We also need our captions to meet consumer needs. If I'm the viewer, the audience, um, it's not always clear to me whether I'm watching something on the TV or the web today. I might be watching something over cable and uh, get interrupted and then come back later and watch that same episode from my computer. So con consumers really want the same access to their captions, the same control over their captions that they have on their TV. It shouldn't be different just because we're on a different platform. So we're working on the underlying platforms and technologies for the web to make it as easy as possible for those captions that already exist for broadcast to just seamlessly move over to the web. So that if you're the viewer, whether you're deaf or hard of hearing or a second language speaker who's just helped by the captions, those captions just work everywhere. They're easy to find and turn on. And you can control whether you see them or not. The last thing that we're doing to help achieve this goal of captioning everything is um, we caption our own videos. So if you look at Google's official channel on YouTube or you look at our developer channel, Google Developers, where we post technical talks on our APIs and technologies, all those videos will have captions. And in fact, if you find a video that's owned by Google that doesn't have captions and you want to watch it, um, please send me an email. Um, my contact information is at the end of this presentation. I'm captioning at Google.com, and we'll make every effort to get captions on those videos. And we do this because we think it makes those videos more useful. So when I think about YouTube, I think about a scale that dwarfs anything that we see today on broadcast TV. YouTube gets over 4 billion views a day, and 60 hours of video are uploaded every single minute. We're now supporting 155 languages and dialects. Um, out of that set of videos, we're still only captioning a drop in the bucket. This to me says we have to make this even easier, and we have to really prove to video owners that there's tremendous value in adding captions. But as of today, over 1.6 million videos on YouTube have closed captions, and 135 million videos have automatic captions. So I'm going to explain a little bit what I mean by automatic captions. We can introduce a few tools to make it easier for video owners to add captions. Um, two of these come from speech recognition, and they're available today in three languages. They're available in Japanese, in Korean, and in English, which is the first language we launched. So the two automatic captioning features are automatic captions and auto timing. And people confuse these a lot, so I'm going to explain them. Automatic captions is where we do pure speech recognition. We run our computers, we listen to what's in the audio, and at the request of the user or the owner of the video, we try to guess what those words were. 
Speech recognition is a very hard problem, and so the accuracy for this is going to be variable. It depends a lot on the quality of the audio. It depends a lot on the accent of the speaker, whether the accent is close to the accents that we use when we build the, build the speech recognition system, or they're a very strong accent that maybe is unfamiliar to our computers. Um, so if you're listening to, say, something that's sort of news quality broadcast, think of like the sound of the voice of a news announcer, that we do really well on. And when we get into noisy videos that are recorded on buses or boats or trains or there's music in the background, it's going to be much harder. And so we present this to the user when you turn it on. We say, look, this is an experimental feature, but we hope it's useful. And we provide it in its current state because we recognize that there are many, many videos that are on YouTube that people want to watch that the video owners have not taken a step to caption yet. And so we provide this as an interim step to help people get some sense of what is in the video. We also make those captions available to the video owners so that if they want, they can download those captions, the ones that are speech recognition captions. They can correct the errors and upload them and make real accurate captions that they reviewed and approved. The other feature that we have from speech recognition is something called auto timing. And when we introduced this, we saw a lot of growth in the use of closed captions on YouTube. What auto timing is, is we take the text of the video. So say you've, you've just recorded a webinar like this one, and you've typed out the text of everything that was said in your webinar. When you post that video to YouTube, you can also upload that text that you typed out. And making text is very easy. Anybody who can type can create a transcript. You upload that transcript to YouTube, and then you ask YouTube to find out where should those time codes be. So YouTube then uses speech recognition to listen to the video, try to figure out where were those words spoken. The words are going to be accurate because they're the words that you typed out yourself and you knew what was in the video. When you upload them, we create the timing. And this means that for many, many people who are creating their videos on YouTube, think about kids in their bedrooms recording a video with their webcam. They can very easily create captions if they want to just by typing and uploading that file to YouTube. So when we think about professionals who are creating captions, think about um, somebody like the Walt Disney Studios. When they're making a movie, like for instance, Cars 2, they have a caption file that goes with that movie when they create the DVDs or when it's broadcast. And we want to be able to reuse that caption file. So we've recently added support to YouTube for many more caption formats. We think it shouldn't matter what format your captions are in, you should just be able to handle it. So today, some of the formats that we can handle are SRT, SVV. We can handle broadcast formats like CAP and SCC and EDUSTL, and we're adding more and more. So if, you have, if you're a broadcaster and you have a file that you've created to put that content out as a broadcast video, you can then reuse that caption file when you go put the video on YouTube, and you can meet the requirements of the law. We've also added support for MPEG-2 import of CEA 608 styled captions. And what this means is um, if you have videos that are archival, there's a lot of government videos, for instance. Um, there's an organization called publicresource.org, and they have a mandate to take archival government videos and import them to YouTube and to other places on the web. Many of those videos already have captions embedded in them. And so we make sure that we preserve those captions if they're in CEA 608 format. And when you watch the video on YouTube, you'll see those captions as well. And finally, we have a bulk caption uploader tool, which we make available so that if you're working with a caption vendor and you send out 500 videos to be captioned and you get them back, you don't have to sit there and upload them one at a time through YouTube. You can just upload them all at once. So if you're curious about reading more, I'm not going to go into great detail about all of these, but if you're curious about reading more, a couple weeks ago we did a blog post on the official YouTube blog about captions. And if you search uh, YouTube blog captions, you'll find it, and it has a lot more detail in all these points. So now I'm going to do a quick demo, and then I'm going to hand it back to Andrew, and he's going to do a demo as well, and then we're going to move into our Q&A. So first of all, I want to show you some of the ways in which uh, captions make videos more useful on YouTube. So I'm going to change windows now. Now I'm on YouTube. And um, on YouTube, I'm going to do a search. And if I search for a phrase in a video, what YouTube will do is it'll actually search through the captions of any captioned videos, and if that phrase exists in the captions, it will help me find that video. So I'm going to search for a phrase. The last time I did a webinar, I used a phrase called the myth of the minority user. So I'm typing that into the search bar on YouTube, and I hit enter to go search it. And YouTube finds all the videos it knows about that use these phrases. And so you see right at the top of my list here, 
I have my first entry, which is accessibility updates for doc sites and calendar. That's my webinar that I did a couple months ago. And you can see that at the bottom, actually, let me make this bigger so you can really see this. Um, I can click start saying it's search term. I have a badge here that says CC that tells me this video is closed captioned as well. So if I click here to start playing the search term, what this does is it jumps me right into the point in the video where I mentioned that phrase, the myth of the minority user. And the text that I see that you see above here, this is the text from what I said in my captions. This didn't appear in the title, it didn't appear in the metadata, it just happened automatically because my captions this video. So I'm going to click on this just to show you. We'll see how well this works in the webinar. So here's playing the video, and um, you can't hear the sound because I've got it turned off to prevent feedback, so this is another reason why you might want to caption your videos if you're going to use them in a webinar. And I'm just going to pause it. So you can see that it's jumped straight to the part in the video where I talk about the myth of the minority user and the fact that uh, people with disabilities actually make up a large percentage of our audience. So here's the captions. A couple things you can do with captions on YouTube. Um, these captions are blocking the bottom part of my chart. I'd really like to see that, so I can click and I can just drag them somewhere else. I can put them to a location that's more convenient for me on the screen. Maybe I want them down in the bottom corner here. Um, and then they'll stay there as I play the video. Uh, the video is playing a little slowly. I can also change the styling of these captions. So I've clicked the caption menu. I have an option to turn captions off if I don't want them. Um, I can go into settings. And when I click settings, I get a bunch of choices for how to style my captions. There are some preset ones, like this is yellow on blue, or maybe I have a real preference for, say, green on yellow, and then I can just pick any of these colors that are provided. I can make my captions, oh, that's really horrible. I'm going to put my captions back to the regular ones. Um, I can make them bigger. And this is one thing that we can do on the web very easily that's helpful for people who have uh, vision difficulty. If we can make captions bigger. We can also make them much smaller. Um, and we can do things like change the font to control whether there's background or no background. So I'm going to leave this. I want to show you quickly that we can also translate them. This uses Google Translate. So I can start with my text in English that I uploaded for my captions, and I can translate it into one of many, many languages. So I'm going to pick, uh, let's pick Russian. I say OK, and I hit play. And now my captions for this video, the audio is in English. My original captions are English, but now I can watch them with captions in Russian. And this won't be perfect. This uses machine translation, which is the same that you would see if you went to translate.google.com and you use translation. But for many videos, the video is very visual. And machine translation is actually getting pretty good these days. So that just having the captions and the ability to quickly translate it um, helps people understand your video and understand what's in it. I'm going to show you very quickly, if you wanted to do automatic captions, you could do transcribe audio here. And this does the speech recognition captions. And you click OK, and it creates them. I'm not going to bother showing you this now, because I want to get to a couple other examples in my demo. Um, if you went to search, let's go back to YouTube.com. And you went under Movies. And let's say you searched for, uh, let's search for life in a day. So here's Life in a Day. I can see again through the batting here, this movie has closed captions. All of these movies don't. This one does. Inspector Gadget does. This one doesn't. Maybe I want to filter these so that I only see videos with closed captions. I can say Filter and just pick CC. And now all of the results that I see here are ones that have closed captions. So I'm going to go look at the movie. This is the movie page. It gives me information about the movie, some reviews, and if I scroll down the page, I can see the number of languages that it's subtitled in. And so these are subtitles that have been professionally translated and added to the video. So any video that you look up in movies on YouTube, you can also find out what other languages are available. Um, and then last, I wanted to show you a demo. Actually, it brought those broadcast captions playing. So I'm going to go here. This is a, a play called Eight that was recently performed in LA. It's, it's based on the transcripts from the court. And this was staged in the theater. And the captions are using broadcast styling to position them underneath the people who are speaking. So I'm going to play just a little bit of it so you can see what that positioning looks like. If I hit play.
And now the captions have moved to the left um, under the person who was speaking. And these are captions that were positioned by a caption vendor who created this caption file. And the file was uploaded. And this helps people to understand who's speaking in the video. And in this one, maybe you can tell because you can see people's mouths move. But if you think about something like an animated video, um, something like Cars 2, for instance, you really can't tell who's speaking unless uh, you have the captions positioned next to them because cartoon characters' mouths often don't move at all, uh, especially if they're cars. So I just wanted to show you this quickly. This is what broadcast captions look like on YouTube. And now I'm going to go back to our presentation and hand it over to Andrew. Okay, so I'm just showing a quick demo, which is uh, also using the uh, the Cinti, um format for the caption data. Um, this is this is a quick demo that we have. It was built using the open source media framework, and what the open source media framework does is it provides a set of developer tools to make it easier to develop um, media players. In this case. Um, so this is some custom work that was done on top of the Simpty Time Text um, format uh, support that we have um, checked in at the uh, at the OSMF. Um, but what this demo adds is it adds um, a variety of additional user controls. So it's similar to what um, was just shown for for YouTube, um, but it gives you an example of um, you know some of the additional capabilities that uh, that you might find. So in this case here, I also did see that there was a question about being able to tab into a media player. Um, in this case, this is a flash-based uh, video window. There are a couple of controls that are part of that. Um, but I can go in uh, from the keyboard and I can tab into these controls um, and interact with them to play the video, for example. And I'm going to let it play for just a couple seconds until we get a decent caption here. Um, all the controls that are beneath this window here, these are all just in HTML using jQuery. Um, but in addition to simply being able to turn the captions on and off, we can also um, choose from, in this case, it's just a small selection of fonts that were choose, chosen to match the, the eight that are provided on broadcast television. But we can choose uh, different caption uh, Fonts there. If it's hard to see, there are there's also caption size controls that goes way up, um, and you can make it as large as is practical. Um, but you do frequently run into issues with uh, captions overlapping the content, which is one of the reasons we've also uh, are demonstrating the capability to make the captions not cover up the video. So if captions covering up the video is a problem. Um, you could offer the functionality for end users so that they could make the captions appear at the bottom, they could appear in the default position, um, or they could appear um, on top, um, above the video. And what this does is it shrinks the video proportionate um, so that it stays proportionate and it's not distorted, but leaves room for the captions uh, above. If you uh, chose to go into a full screen, th that would still be honored um, in that it's full screen experience, but it's not full screen just with the video window. Um, that's, that would still be, of course, possible if the user had their uh, captions positioned over the video. Um, there's additional caption controls that are down below here as well in terms of being able to, um, it's possible to offer end users a full range of controls. This shows you the opacity for uh, the background and you know, the background color can be changed as well. So you can make the captions uh, as perfect for you and as horrible for uh, someone who prefers something different uh, as you as you want. Um, there's also uh, various possibilities in terms of outline coloring and being able to um, modify that, uh, that outline thickness. So this is not um, the polished demonstration that shows you how this is implemented around the world. And it's you know, wonderful what uh, YouTube has done, and we applaud that work. Um, this is more to show you the uh, raw capabilities that are available to people who are using uh, the open source media framework. So that's the um, that's the uh, quick demo there for that, and um, 
And then I think we're uh, switching back to um, uh, the slides. Uh, so please uh, feel free to continue typing questions into your chat window. Uh, we're going to start off with a couple, but we'll continue to, to pull them together. Uh, so the first one I want to bring up for both Naomi and Andrew is uh, HTML5 and WebBTT and how they play into uh, this web video accessibility game. So maybe I can I can start talking about WebBTT and, and HTML5 and <clears throat> Andrew, you can see if I if I've missed anything. So YouTube is available today in both with both HTML5 browsers and ones that don't yet support it. And so we're pursuing all possible options to get videos to our viewers to make sure that they just work. That said, HTML5 is still evolving today. And although WebBTT is being developed and added to WebKit, it's not fully implemented yet. And so as it becomes more fully implemented, you'll see more native support for it in YouTube. But today, these are still technologies that are evolving because we need uh, all the browsers to support them. Yep, and, and I think that um, just about covers it in that there's, there's um, work that is uh, going on uh, to not only to define uh, the support within the browsers, but for the formats also, there's you know two, two or three formats that are really um, popular out there: uh, with VTT, TTML, and Simply Time Text. And you know we're really looking at you know what has to be done either through JavaScript um, polyfills for um, browsers in the short term, or for adding in native support into the browsers directly. Um, so it's it's a it's a little bit of a mess actually. But uh, but it, there's there's lots of work going on, so it's improving. I would I would say it's something of a familiar mess. If you if you think about how video works on the web today, we don't have any one video format either. And so the most popular formats, the ones that have the content that people want, tend to be the ones that browsers support. And I think we'll see that evolving on the web as well. Um, certainly on, on the YouTube standpoint, if if you have a video and you have captions, we want to make sure that it's really easy for you to take the captions you already have and just add them to YouTube. And we don't think that the video owner should have to become an expert in all of these different caption formats. So our, our long-term goal is to support you know, whatever format the captions are coming to us that should just work on YouTube. Great. Uh, so there's a question about kind of internal resources. Clearly, both of these organizations, Google and Adobe, have devoted quite a bit of resources and effort around this accessibility effort. Uh, uh, can you both talk a little bit about how that started and how you've been able to really fight for resources, uh, both to tell the story and as well as uh, maybe some advice for, for other organizations who are trying to do the same thing? Sure, I can I can take a quick stab at that first. Um, I think the important piece um, is that you know you have to rec recognizing that um, accessibility is uh, you know a very important feature, but it's it's not the only feature that uh, product teams are looking at. So it is um, always important to you know keep an eye on the business case. Um, and that means, you know, talking to customers, talking to end users, and figuring out, um, you know, exactly what the the needs are, and making sure that is, you know, presented, uh, you know, a, in a clear and straightforward way um, to help make sure that um, people understand the the business rationale for doing this work um, for accessibility, and you know, by translation, making sure that you know staffing is uh, appropriate for for the task. Um, and you know, at Adobe, we have you know a number of people who are uh, dedicated to accessibility as their full-time job. But there's also a lot of people that um, work on accessibility in uh, different projects um, from time to time. So you know, one of the big big pieces that has been you know increasingly important is making sure that we're doing education work uh, internally to uh, ensure that staff have uh, Knowledge of accessibility and that it's not starting from uh, scratch each time. Uh, each time you have some accessibility work that needs to be done, so it's really there's there's significant education efforts that need to be done 
Um, and that and that same work also translates over to getting you know, broader support for accessibility initiatives in general. Yeah, I mean, I want to I want to second that about you know the question of, of finding resources in any large company. To find resources, you're you're going to need to make a business case for it. And I think there is a very strong business case to be made for doing accessibility well. Um, if you're thinking about videos that are aimed at say enterprise users, one user at a large corporation who has an accessibility need can inform the buying decisions of that entire company. And you can wait for legislation that says, oh, you have to do this, here's the law, here's what's required and what's exempt. Or you can think of it as an audience question and think about, well, how do I meet the needs of all of my users? And when you do that, in our case at any rate, we found that there's a lot of strong business reasons to do this. Um, so that's important. The other thing I think that I found has been very helpful in working with engineers who need to learn about accessibility is when people don't put accessibility in, it's rarely because you know, they hate blind users, they hate deaf users, it's because they don't know what to do. They see it as a very big problem that has no easy solution. And many, many aspects of accessibility on the web today are quite well known. And so the more that you can educate people about what is actually needed in order to meet the needs of these users, I think the easier it is to find people who are willing to step up and do that work. Um, it's not a great mystery what's needed to do these things. Great. Uh, there are a couple more questions about HTML5, actually, and mobile devices. Uh, so if we go back to that for a second, could you talk a little bit about uh, feature parity with mobile devices and, and kind of how far or close are we to having that same you know, really nice accessible experience that we see on the web uh, kind of coming through on a, on a tablet or phone? So feature parity on mobile is really important to us. You look at the growth in use of mobile, and people are using their mobile devices more than their desktop sometimes. And we really want those videos with captions to just be available everywhere. That said, the technology on mobile devices is also still evolving, and the browsers that are available and the video players that are available on mobile devices, um, there's a lot of technologies out there. And so that's certainly something that we're working very hard on right now is to extend the support that we have across as many mobile devices as possible. So today, for instance, if you watch a video on YouTube using an Android phone, the player on Android that knows about video also knows about YouTube captions. And so you can watch caption videos on your Android device. But on other devices, um, it's, it's more difficult because you need to access sort of the system level player, and it can take time to make those changes and get them up to all the phones. So we're working on it. It's a hard problem, um, but we're excited about solving it. Yeah, and I would add to that that um, I mean the different mobile platforms are handling captions differently, um, and the um, uh, depending on how you're delivering your video, there may also be differences. So, you know, if you're delivering video on Android and you're you know relying on the Flash Player for that video, you can have the exact same experience um, as you get uh, via desktop. Um, on iOS, it's going to be a, a different. Th th System because um, in iOS they have the um, caption controls are at the platform level um, and uh, the experience is is a, a different one. It's not an inferior one necessarily, but it's uh, but it's different. So I mean, will we see a time where it's exactly the same experience, irrespective of mobile devices that you're working with? I would suspect not. Although we certainly would expect that we have the same baseline expectations for what is uh, required to qualify as a satisfactory uh, or even an excellent uh, caption experience, but it may not be that it's identical. Great. Uh, so there's some questions about audio description. Uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, how that plays into some of the accessibility functionality that's being developed uh, and even what kind of demand you've seen compared to captions? It seems that there's a, a lot more kind of obvious demand for captions right now. Uh, but are you are you hearing much around audio description as well? I mean, from the YouTube side, I think audio description is, is still really emerging as a technology that people who are posting videos even know about and, and are trying to use. And so if you do a search on YouTube, um, actually, can you pass me the screen? I can, I can show you where you can find some audio description on YouTube if you bounce that back to me. Um, you can do a search on audio description or audio described on YouTube, and you can find videos that do have it. Um, so let me show you, for instance. 
let's go to YouTube, and I'm going to search for audio described. Uh, let's search for life in a day, because I know that one has some. So here we have life in a day, audio described. And you can see that audio described is just put in the title. We don't today have any kind of badging that lets you easily find all the videos with audio description. And the numbers today are very, very small. Um, but a growing number of video producers are creating audio description, and more and more people are becoming aware of it. And as that momentum grows, I think we will see support for it. So today the answer on YouTube is upload a second video. So we do this for life in a day, and we've done this for a couple of our, of our ad spots. And we've even captioned, so I can show you the audio description. Maybe not everybody on here knows what audio description is. Uh, let's go ahead. There's nothing going on here. Oh, you know what? Maybe I didn't have, I may not have the audio description captions on here. We often put them on. I'll have to double check later. Um, but the audio description is just audio in the background that's describing the visual elements of it. So today we do it on YouTube by mixing that back in. But we're also exploring ways, for instance, through WebKit and HTML5 that you could use a format like, say, WebVGT to provide time text to your browser and let your browser use speech synthesis on your computer, just play that text back to you so you could have audio description very easily without the, the need for a lot of video production overhead. But today, this is sort of still an emerging technology. You can find out your description on YouTube. It's not fully integrated as a separate audio track um, the way it is on your TV today. And audio description, um, I mean, from my perspective, has not been as often requested. It's it is mentioned in, uh, I mean, it's a part of the CBAA legislation. Um, it's not going to have the same same level of mandate that there exists for closed captioning, but um, at least for internet-based um, video. Uh, one of the biggest challenges with it right now is just the cost in that to do audio description, you've got to have um, someone who's skilled with writing to be able to correctly author the audio description and then you have to record it as an audio file, and then you've got to add it in and deliver it um, with the video. There is some interesting work that's gone on uh, recently. IBM and WGBH have done some work to investigate you know, text-based audio description, and I think Google's done some investigations around this area as well um, in, uh, with the use of uh, WebVPT. So there's, uh, there's interesting possibilities out there that may lower the bar for um, uh, cost to, to deliver audio description. So there's some, some exciting possibilities because it, it's uh, you know, no less important for blind users than captions are for deaf users. So it's good to see additional work going on. Great. Uh, so especially after seeing the caption search functionality on YouTube, um, can either of you share any information you have about how uh, captions affect SEO, um, or even the way Google indexes video outside of YouTube? I guess that would be me. Um, <laughs> if, if your video has captions, and, and by captions I mean ones that you as the video owner have uploaded, uh, we will index those and your video will be found more easily in search. And that's true on Google search, it's true on YouTube search. And if you've translated your captions and uploaded captions in multiple languages, imagine somebody is searching on a phrase in French. Well, if you have French captions and the words in that phrase appear in your captions because you've translated them, then that will help a video be found through search. And we're finding that just adding the captions does help people get their videos uh, found in search much more easily than if they didn't have them. Great. Uh, there's actually a couple questions about uh, Adobe products, uh, Andrew, if you don't mind, uh, specifically about when captioning will be available natively in, in Premiere Pro and Encore. Um, do you have any information you're allowed to share on that? Well, I, I, I uh, responded back to try and get a little bit more information about the question um, because the question is, you know, what exactly, what aspect of native support we're, we're talking about. Um, Premiere allows you to import 608 and 708 uh, data files. Um, if the question is about, you know, is Premiere going to offer um, a caption editing tool uh, or a caption authoring tool within within Premiere, 
that's something that uh, I can't speak to. I know there's a there's a lot of high quality caption tools that are out there, and in terms of standard broadcast workloads, um, you know, captioning is something that is generally outsourced to you know professional firms that do the work and do it well. Um, if it's talking about you know support for uh, display within the authoring environment of the caption data, um, and that's available in the last uh, in the last release so that's available presently. So um, I'm not sure whether I'm hitting the mark in terms of the uh, intent of the original question, but um, that's uh, that's my response. Great. Uh, so some questions also about uh, that customizable caption functionality that we saw from both of you. Uh, what happens when that video gets embedded onto someone else's web page? So out of kind of the native platform um, and now on, on another website, is, is all that functionality still there? So for, for YouTube, if you're embedding a YouTube video in a website, that caption menu will be available and, and you can change it, work with it um, to the extent that I think the limitation is your the window in which you dropped the image has to be big enough that we can actually get a menu in there. So you may need to ask your, web, your webmaster to play around to make sure that it's at least big enough that you can get to the menu. But yes, all those things work with, a, with an embed. Oh, and Andrew, is there a multi-language uh, caption support for the OSMF repository? The support is uh, sort of language agnostic in that, you know, there is there's nothing that uh, undermines your ability to deliver uh, captions in multiple languages. You would need to, with uh, the OSMF player, you need to build in a, a player control, you know, a control that would allow the user to switch between the different caption tracks. Um, so in that regard, yes, it is, um, you know, certainly something that is capable, but uh, the developer toolkit does not, you know, provide you anything that you, that you would, you know, just pop in place and it supports uh, you know, n number of um, languages automatically. So we have, we are actually out of time. It looks like. Um, thanks everyone for your questions. Thank you, Andrew and Naomi, for spending time with us uh, and presenting on accessibility and answering all these questions. Uh, as we mentioned, we will be posting this on our website. We hope to have it up tomorrow. Um, certainly feel free to check back and you will be getting an email when that presentation is up with captions. Uh, so again, please feel free to reach out. Our contact info is here up on the slide and Naomi and Andrew are nice enough to provide their contact information. Uh, so thanks everyone for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.